away from the beautiful gate. Turn away from the beautiful gate. With sadness, the mourn of the sorrowful state. Turn away from the beautiful gate. Turn away. Beautiful gates with sadness, the mourn of the sorrowful state. Turn away from the beautiful gate. Last night, as I lay sleeping, a dream came to me. I dreamed about the end of time, about eternity. I saw a million sinners fall on their knees to pray. The Lord just sadly shook his head, and this I heard him say. Sorry, I never knew. from me forevermore sorry I never knew you go and serve the one that you have served before sorry I never knew Forevermore. Sorry. Sorry. I never, I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you have served before. Turn away. Turn from the beautiful gate. When I must face the trial, I told the Lord that I had been a Christian all the while. But through his book, he vainly looked and sadly shook his head. He placed me over on his left, and this I heard him say, Sorry! I never knew you. I have no record of your birth. Sorry. Sorry. I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you served while on earth. Sorry. have no record of your birth. Sorry, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one that you served while on earth. Turned away from the beautiful gate. the beautiful From the beautiful gate with sadness, the mourn of their sorrowful state. Turn away from the beautiful gate. As you live every moment 
think of eternity there is a great day coming when before god you'll stand repent of sins and resolve to live a holy life so when that day comes you will have no regrets to be well repent and get to evil there is no time to linger here Precious Father, we are grateful unto you for who you are. We thank you for the opportunity we have to make right our ways before you while we are still on this side of eternity. Ancient of days, we hand over ourselves unto you that none of us will lead to regret ever living in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to serve you with all our hearts, to follow you with all our hearts, 
to do your will until the day of the Lord in Jesus' name. Speak to our hearts now and grant us the grace that we will not be mere hearers of your word, but to do us of it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I welcome you to the worship service today in Jesus' name. We are going to be looking at the message titled, It Is Your Choice. It is your choice. Whatever happens to you in life, whatever you become in life, is going to be the aftermath of the decision that you have made. We see in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 15, where the man of God over there, Joshua, was talking to the people of his time, ministering to the entire nation of Israel and their leader, telling them, after leading them for so many years, after showing them the way of the Lord, after living an exemplary life before them, he told them, if it seemed good unto you, or if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here we see Joshua telling the people that in any and every area of life where you may find yourself, there are people that are ungodly. There are people that are serving other gods other than the living God. And so he said, before the flood, that means while you were there in Egypt, before the sea, before the Red Sea, before you cross over to this other side, he said, over there they had their gods that they were serving. If those are the gods, not one god, so many gods, if those are the gods that you want to serve, make up your mind. And then, after leaving Egypt, we said bye-bye to Egypt, and then we crossed the Red Sea. We came to this other side of eternity. And then, over there, we found the Canaanites also in the land. We found the people of all the religion also worshipping idols. And then, Joshua said, whether the idols before the sea or the idols after the sea, you decide which one you want to serve between them. Whether the God of the Egyptians or the God of the Canaanites. Whether the God of the Egyptians or the God of the Amorites. Whether the God of the Egyptians or the God of the Gagashites. Whether the God of the Egyptians or any other God other than the real God. Make up your mind. It is your choice. It is your decision. He said, but listen to this. Lo, we have searched it. And so it is. And he said... As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I pray you will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. It is your choice. Nobody can force you. Nobody can compel you. You can be admonished. You can be encouraged. You can be advised. But what you finally will decide to do is going to be your own choice. That wasn't the only time. That the issue of making up one's mind came up in the book of Kings, First Kings, chapter 18, verse 21. We see the case of Elijah also confronting the people of his time and challenging them to make up their mind, to make up their mind on where they want to be, who they want to serve, who they want to follow for the rest of their life. First Kings chapter 18, verse 21. And Elijah came unto all the people, all the people, not just some of them, not just to the leaders alone, not just to the congregation alone, all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? Between two opinions. Now that means the people were thinking, Is it here? Is it there? Is it this God? Is it the other God? Which one should we go for? How long will you be halting between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. 
And the people answered him, not a word. Here we see what looks like indecision, and yet the die is cast. For the people of Israel at the time of Elijah, even though Elijah said, make up your mind, stop indecision, even though a decision is made, and the people answered him not a word. They answered him not a word, not because they didn't know what their decision was. They actually have casted their lot for Baal for over the years, for so many years. They have been worshipping Baal. They have been serving Baal. The king of the time was worshipping Baal. The people of the time were, were worshipping Baal. And so, Elijah said, the time has come that the final decision be made. Instead of halting between the temple and the shrine, between the church and wherever you go after the church, make up your mind who you really want to serve. Between the world and the church, make up your mind where you really want to be. And the people answered him, not a word, not a word. They didn't answer because of fear, not because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't answer because of what the people will say. And so, Joshua made them to know that God is God. God is God. How did he make them to know that? Because they couldn't really stand and say, yes, we stand for God. Now, before you blame, criticize, or condemn the Israelites, aren't you like that in your place of war? That because of the fear of what man will say, because of the fear of you losing your job, because of the fear of the multitude around you, you cannot stand and say, I belong to God. You cannot stand and say, I am a child of God. You cannot stand and say, I am different from you all. That is exactly what happened at the time of the Israelites because uh, everybody was jo were just following the multitude, the multitude. Uh, wherever the multitude goes, everybody goes. There is no personal decision. There is no personal instinct. There is no personal uh, 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 determination to say, I will be different. And I pray that today you will be different. Amen. Choice is a God-given enablement to man. For the purpose of self-decision and subsequent accountability, that simply means that whatsoever you decide, you will be held responsible for your decision. Choice is something that is preferred over and above all other considerations. The result of choice leads to either regret or rejoicing. Choices are facts of life. Man was created with the ability to make choices. Choices are made on a daily basis. You, for you to be here today, it was a decision that you made. There are people that ought to be here now, they are not here. For you to be here today is your own choice. The choice are there before us on a daily basis. The choice to embrace evil or, evil, uh, or good. Is always there before us every day. The choice to live righteously or unrighteously is there before us every day. The choice of who our friends should be, our associates, our companion. The choice is there before us every day. The choice to go into light or darkness. The choice to embrace light or darkness is there every day. The choice for the truth or for falsehood is there every day every day. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And the choice to follow God or to follow the devil is there before us all, uh, every day. Of course, some choices are tougher or harder than other choices. Yet, it is a choice that we must make. The choice you make today will determine what will become of the rest of your life. The choice you make, whether in the area of marriage, in the area of business, in the area of religion, will determine what will become the rest of your life. Choices affect our lives. The choice of decision, the choice of submission, the choice of obedience or disobedience, the choice of church, the choice of the house you want to buy, the choice of the car you want to buy, the choice of career, 
It's all yours. It's all yours. And then, who do you want to marry? Where do you want to marry from? When do you want to marry? It's your choice. It's your choice. Where do you want to live? It's a choice you must make yourself. But understand, the most important of them all is the choice of salvation. If you miss heaven, you will die. Because salvation is what will determine where eventually you spend eternity. I pray you will not miss heaven. The choice of eternity should make us think and question, where will I spend eternity? Don't wait for anybody to ask you, where will you spend eternity? Ask yourself, where will I spend eternity? Where do I want to spend eternity? And as you ask that question, I pray the right answer will come in Jesus' name. When we talk about eternity, please understand. Everybody will live eternally. Whether you are a man or you are a woman, whether you are, uh, whether you are a saint or you are a sinner, everybody will live through eternity. So then, the case or the essence of eternity is not about the duration of it. No, it's not about how long. It is about the... The, 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 the value of it is about the quality of eternity where you are going to live. This is what I'm talking about. If you die as a saint, you go to eternity, you live with God all to eternity. If you die as a sinner, you also go to eternity, but you go to a hellfire and live with the devil all the rest of eternity. So, whether as a saint or a sinner, we are all going to get into eternity, but what part of eternity will you end? Where will that your end be? And every day of our life, we have the choice of making up our mind, the right, the freedom, the liberty to decide where that eternity will be. Yours will be in heaven. I say yours will be in heaven. You know, we are confronted daily with this choice and decision of either being religious or having relationship with God. That is the choice of religion versus relationship. This is what I'm talking about. There were two people that went into the temple to pray. One was a help me. One is a publican, not a republican. One is a publican and the other one is what? A Pharisee now. In the light of the time that they lived in, the publican were considered sinners, worthless people, terrible people, very, very bad people. The Pharisees were considered religious people. And we were told from church history that if you are going to be a real Pharisee, a leader of that, you must be able to read the Bible from cover to cover. The Bible as it was in the Old Testament. Now, they both went to pray and then one of them got there and began to say, Lord, you look at me, see me. I'm religious. I come to church every day. I fast every time. I pay my tithe and offering. I am not like that other person. Bad, terrible, rejected, and condemned by the world. And yet, the publican, who knew he was bad? Who knew he was a sinner? Who knew he needed mercy? Who knew he needed pardon and forgiveness? Went and said, Lord, I am not worthy of anything. I am actually worthless. The people that rejected me, they were right rejecting me. All I need is mercy. Have mercy upon me. According to the multitude of your mercy, have mercy upon me. And that man was justified more than that religious person. How religious are you? Are you so religious to the point that you don't see the need for you to have a personal relationship with God anymore? This is what I'm talking about. You're a member of this church. You'll be coming to the church, maybe from maybe you were even born in the church, not just from childhood. Maybe you've been there for 
10 years, 20 years, maybe over 30 years. And now, all you have pulled up is just church, church, church. Personal relationship with God is not there anymore. I pray a change will come your way, come your life in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Going further in that passage, verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. May, you may not know, many a times, the yoke we have placed upon ourselves, the yoke of religion, the yoke of church, the yoke of dogma, is killing us under the weight of that yoke. But Jesus is saying, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. When you go into the book of uh, Corinthians chapter 1, verse th uh, chapter 13, uh, looking at it, uh, quite the whole chapter, but just looking at verses 1 to 3, it's telling us about gifts and charity. There are people that, so, that are so much concerned about gifts, about talent, about what they have, much more than charity. Charity there is love. Charity there is godliness. Charity there is submission. Charity there is honesty and sincerity. Charity there is holiness and righteousness. And they are so much concerned about their gift, about their talent, more than their life in God. Religion is more important to them than relationship with God. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. So that tells us that knowing the Bible, being able to quote the Bible, being able to recite the Bible is not enough to get you to heaven. I talk about religion versus relationship. Uh, what, again, do we look at as we prepare for eternity? We look at reasons versus revelation. Reasons versus re revelation. You know, many years back when I was uh, not born again, but religious, I thought it was just easy to live that holy life. And uh, without going through the process, of course, I didn't know the process then. And I tried and failed and tried and failed, and then I concluded it wasn't possible to live that life, but one day came, and that day will come to your life. And I met the Lord, and my sins were washed away. And I knew within me, I became a new creature. I confessed my sins and turned them over unto the Lord. And then I realized that it wasn't just about me reasoning how to live that life. It is the revelation of what God has done through his son on the cross of Calvary. It is the blood of Jesus that washes clean from all sin. From all sin. Matthew chapter 11 verse 25. Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25. There the Bible says, at that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them unto little children. Revelation. Reveal them unto little children. Because you say, how can a mortal man live above sin? How can a mortal man live without telling lies? How can a mortal man live without immorality? How can a mortal, a mortal man live without offending anybody? Well, it is by revelation. Revelation of the grace of God. For that grace has appeared unto all men, teaching us that deny ungodliness we should depart from all unrighteousness. First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, had God chosen, yea, and things which are not to 
uh, which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So that is telling you that it's it is not of him that are running, but it is of God that showed mercy. He's telling you that it's not because of your talent, because of your gift, because of your intellect, because of your money, because of your exposure, because of uh, uh, who you know, who you didn't know. No, it is the grace of God that will make you to know that anything you have, whoever you are, is nothing in the sight of God. It's, you need that revelation, I need that revelation. And then to think that uh, well, because I have this position, I have have this title, then I am qualified. No, position does not qualify anybody. Title does not qualify anybody. Activity does not qualify anybody. Only by revelation you will, will you know that it is only righteousness that will take you and I to heaven. What do we need to do? Then make up your mind and make the right decision. And then go by revelation that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Understand that it is the grace of God by the grace of God, through the grace of God, that we can live that holy life. What then do you do? Make up your mind that instead of resisting the word of God, resisting the power of God, resisting the people of God, oh, you repent. So then you have to make up your mind again, decision between resistance and uh, repentance. Between resistance and repentance, there are people that you teach them the word of God, you preach to them the word of God, and they will criticize it, they will condemn it, they will reject it, they will give reasons and give you examples upon examples, and the word of the Lord is saying, that is it. Stop reasoning, start believing. Stop reasoning, start repenting. Man has a choice whether to resist or to repent when God is dealing with him. God speaks to us in many ways. He can speak to us through someone, like we're hearing the someone today. To examine yourself, to examine your life, and be better prepared for eternity. He can speak to us through testimonies of the lives of other people. He can speak to us through the challenges in the lives of other people. He can speak to you, speak to me through a friend, through circumstances and situations. He can speak to us through inner conviction. You know, he spoke unto Pharaoh through dream. He spoke to Nebuchadnezzar through dream. So he still speaks today. He can still speak to you through dream. He can touch your conscience and speak to you therein. But if you block God out of your life, if you close the door against God, where will you spend eternity? Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 51. Understand, if you keep rebelling, if you keep disobeying, if you remain stubborn and unyielding, one day will come that the judgment of God will come without any remedy for you. Acts chapter 7 verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. As your fathers did, so do ye. And so, corrections are coming your way. The pastor will tell you, this is not right. Do this. You are stubborn. You are rebellious. You are full of your own way. The Bible says you are stiff-necked. The Bible says you are resisting the Holy Ghost. And you know, forget about the pastor. Forget about any other person talk, talking to you. Even God himself came to you. Came to your heart. Spoke to your heart. Broke you, met you, you felt the remorse for a moment, and then you got to yourself and said, No, I will not, I will not. You may resist today. When the judgment day will come, you will never be able to resist the judgment and the condemnation of a fire. So make up your mind instead of resisting, repent. Renounce your sin, return unto the Lord, and let him have mercy upon you in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today. Calling it when? Today. When? Uh, after a long time, he spoke unto you through David, as was said before, he said today, if you hear his voice, do not Having your heart, just like as it was in the day of provocation. And the Lord is saying the same thing today. Do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. In the book of Luke chapter 15, looking at it from verse 17, the prodigal son. The prodigal son. 
who found themselves in this situation where a decision needed to be made. Understand, he knew what it, mean, it means to make a decision. He took a decision before when he told the father, give me the portion of the property that belongs unto me. And I needed to go. I needed freedom. I need my own liberty from you. And the father did not argue. You know many a times, parents, there is no point arguing with the children. They want to go their way, let them go. Leaders, sometimes there is no point arguing with the members. They want to have it their way, let them have it their way. A time will come that they will know and understand that their decision or the choice of the decision they made is wrong. And only we pray that they will have the grace to be able to make right their wrongs at such a time in Jesus' name. When the prodigal son came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He decided for a change. Somebody here today will decide for a change in Jesus' name. Now, when he made that decision, he killed procrastination. He didn't say, just I will, I will, I will. Yes, he began with I will. But then he followed through with action. And then the Bible says he arose. Somebody here will arise. I said, somebody here will arise. And then he arose because initially he said, I will arise. I will go on to my father. And I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. Do not consider me to be your child anymore, but just accept me as one of your servants. And then the Bible said, he arose. He arose. He said, I have thought about this for too long. I have meditated on this for too long. It's time for me to take an action. And then he arose. And then he took the first step. And it's like the devil is saying, what do you think you are doing? What do you think you are doing? And he took the second step. And by the time he took the third step, he was free. Somebody here will be free in Jesus' name. Maybe the thought of restitution has been there in you. Go do this restitution. Go do that restitution. And the devil is fighting it. And he's fighting it. And then you're saying, I will, I will, I will. For how long will you dwell on procrastination? Do it now. And put the devil to shame. And God will be glorified in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if we remain unrepentant, if we remain uh, uh, in stubbornness, if we remain the way we are right now, a time will come that the Spirit of the Lord will leave us. The prompting of the Lord, the correction of the Lord will disappear from us and then we get to a point of reprobation. We become reprobates. That will even be arguing against the Bible, arguing against the truth. So instead of us getting our lives transformed, getting our lives reformed by the authority of the Word of God, we become a reprobate. Understand, man has a choice whether to end up as a reprobate or as a reformed person. Lazarus and the rich man are examples, they both had the opportunity. Of living for God. Lazarus made up his mind to live for God. The rich man made up his life to live for the world and enjoy the riches of the world, the wealth of the world, and the glory of this age. At the end of the day, the rich man regretted in eternity. He was actually begging just for a drop of water on his tongue. And even that he couldn't get. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. Now, David was a king. I'm talking about reprobation or reformation. David, as a king, committed immorality. And then the prophet came and said, King, he first of all gave him a proverb. And the king said, The man that did this should, should die. And then the prophet said, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. Thou art the man. You that you are always pointing accusing finger to other people, the Lord is saying you are the man. You are the woman. Look inward. Look inward and deal with your situation. And then David had a choice of either standing against the prophet, imprisoning the prophet, even killing the prophet, or 
repenting. David made the right choice. He repented. He sought the Lord and he was forgiven. About the same David when he said the nation of Israel should be counted. You know, sometimes it may not be big, big sin as we may call it. Uh, you told a lie, you sinned. It may be just in the course of duty you made a mistake. And then a correction is coming. Maybe judgment came. Punishment came. And uh, David was such a man that related with God so much that he would never, never take God for granted. And David, instead of saying, Lord, but you remember when we left Egypt, when Israel left Egypt, after Genesis, and then we had the Exodus, and then eventually we get into the book of Number. You told us to number. David was not giving excuses. David was not arguing with the Lord. David repented, and even when he was going to make sacrifice uh, at the feet of Arauna, the, the Arauna said, okay, take him for free. He said, no, I will not give unto God, I will not sacrifice unto God that which cost me nothing. Many a times, God is correcting us, even in the course of duty, and yet we are so obstinate, we are so unrepentant. I pray that we don't get to a point whereby it will be too late for us to repent in Jesus' name. John chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This is said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag. And bear what was put therein. Understand, the point I'm making here is, there are a lot of people, Judas Iscariot was with Jesus himself for three and a half years, and yet he missed heaven. You will not miss heaven in Jesus' name. There are people in the church that because of jealousy, because of envy, of other people because of pride, of who they are, what they have, or they say some things, they do some things. If you don't have the spirit of discernment, you don't understand that it is not out of a pure mo motive. It is not out of a right motive. It is not out of godliness that it is out of selfishness and self-centeredness. And they say that thing, and if you are not careful, you just follow them, and then they accomplish their goal Judas Iscariot was talking spiritual here. Why are we wasting this much oil? We should have sold it and do this and do that with it. And the Bible said no. Not because he was concerned about the poor, but he was a thief. He was a thief. You will not be a thief in Jesus' name. Well, you, so then you have to decide whether to be uh, reformed or to become a reprobate. You also will need to decide whether you are getting into what I call renunciation, renouncing the Lord. Renouncing the Lord. Like Peter renounced the Lord. I didn't know him. Rejecting the Lord. Or you are resolving. Paul said, I know my belief. Paul said, I am fully persuaded. So then, whether you are getting into renunciation or resolution, you have to make up your mind. Otherwise, you will end up in eternity before you understand it. Man has a choice. In the face of persecution and sacrifice, uh, 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 and sacrifice for the sake of eternity, for the sake of Christ, whether to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ or resolve to follow him, to the very end, no matter what the price may be. Many people follow Jesus for a time until one day he thought of uh, the thought of a difficult message that he preached. And that you'll find in the book of John chapter 6. Reading from verse 60 through to 67. And then let's take a quick look at 60, verse 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. John Chapter 6, verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, many therefore of his followers, 
Many therefore of his students, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, say, this is an hard saying. Who can bear it? Stop right there. This is a hard saying. Do you know that there are so many people today that does not believe in the teaching and the doctrine of holiness anymore? There are many people today that will be questioning the integrity of the scripture, the authenticity of the scripture. And they tell you, was it not written by mom? But then, there are people that are in the church. They claim to love the Lord. They claim to be religious. They claim to be faithful. They claim to be giving their church and everything. But the day you preach a message that will touch on their sin, the day you preach a message that will touch on their transgression, that very day you see the other side of their eyes. Don't you know there are people, or churches rather, that is not being run by the pastor of the church? But board of elders, board of trustees, and they, they are the higher that they are the ones that hires and fires. And when the board of trustee, maybe the chairman of the board, is into immorality or does anything wrong, the pastor has no mouth to talk because the pastor loves his job, he wants his job. If he talks, he's gone. The members of the committee, the board of trustees. They are doing, doing things that are not right, and the pastor cannot talk, and it is a very delicate thing. Flip it around. There are also pastors that feel, I am in church. I can do anything. I can do it anyhow. Nobody can touch me. Hey, if nobody can touch you, there is somebody who can touch you. I said there is somebody who can touch you. And when that person touches you, no man will be able to deliver you. So whether you are the pastor or you are anything in the church, understand that we all will stand before the judgment of the living God. And so here it is. Jesus preached the message that appeared hard, tough, and difficult for the people. Instead of saying, Lord, give us the grace to be able to comply what did they do? The Bible says many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is an hard thing. Who can bear it? Verse 66. John to verse 66. From that time, from that time, what happened? Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They went back. They went no more with him. Now, if you were to be a pastor, that you have been praying, God build my church, increase the church, multiply the church. And then because of one message, because of one action, because of one discipline, because of one correction, and then the people gang up together. And then they, lay, they, they leave the church. How do you feel? Of course, sad and sorrowful. And then you want to try to say, okay, let me not go there anymore. Let me not touch that anymore. Not Jesus. Somebody say, not Jesus. When the people, because the Bible says many, many, not just one. And for them to do that, it means they all spoke together. They all agreed together. Let us do it. And you know, conspiracy happens in the church. Conspiracy happens on the job. Conspiracy happens in the family. Conspiracy happens everywhere. Let us abandon this person. Let us isolate this person. And Jesus look at those that remain. How many of them remain? Twelve of them. Verse 67. Read for me what you see there. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. What happened? Will you also go away? Will you also go away? If you want to go the way they have gone, you are free to go. If you want to abandon me the way they have gone, you are free to go. But understand, it's a matter of eternity. They will reject me now. I will reject them later. If they receive me now, I will receive them later. Will you also go away? And so, if because of righteousness and holiness and purity and uprightness, there is conspiracy against you, there is nothing for you to worry about. One with God. 
is in the majority, and the Lord will keep you company in Jesus' name. So, whether on your job, because a lot of them are anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-righteousness, you don't have to follow them. Do not follow the multitude to commit sin. Because everybody is doing it, then you must do, it, you must do the same thing as they are doing. No. And there, you decide for yourself that by the grace of God, others may I will not. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20. Matthew chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. But, it's, but he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the world, by and by he is offended. Look up here. There are many people in the church. You think they are nice sisters. You think they are nice brother. You wait. You wait until something happens. Then you see their true color. Then you see their true nature. And then you see that the word of God they have been hearing has no root in them. Root in them. That is why it's not enough for you to come to church on Sunday alone. And there are some of you. And if I step on your toe, forgive me. And if you cannot forgive me, eternity is waiting for you. You come to church on Sunday and all you want to do is just activity, activity. Bible study, you are never there. You are not feeding yourself. You are not building yourself. You are not getting yourself deeper in the word of God. You are busy going for money, running for money. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then on Sunday, you put on clothes and you are coming to church, brother. You are coming to church, sister. And all you want to do is just to come and sing. It's not like that. You don't get to heaven that way. You don't make heaven that way. All you want to do is to come and be an usher. All you want to do is just to get behind the keyboard or electronic or whatever you do in the church. Or oh, the children church. The word of God is telling us that these people had no root in them. When persecution comes, you will not be able to stand. When opposition comes, you will not be able to stand. When the trials of life comes, you will not be able to stand. Equip yourself. Get empowered before you get engaged in anything of the Lord. So that your labor will not be in vain. And I pray you will not labor in vain. Amen. Amen. The Bible says uh, they get offended. By and by. When tribulation came. When persecution comes. And then uh, they took offense. And then they abandoned everything. That is why the Bible said lay hands suddenly on no man. You know there are times. That because we, we, we want to grow the church. We are bothered. We are troubled. Why is the church not growing? Why, oh, don't you understand? The reason why the church is not growing. If we begin to throw party every week. The church will grow. If we begin to do things they do in the world, the church will grow. If we turn the other eye to sins and transgressions of people, the church will grow. If we allow our young people, you, to be living a promiscuous life, the church will grow. Everybody is having boyfriend, everybody having girlfriend. And then with all their immorality and then they commit sin within the week and on Sunday they come and sing amazing grace, the church will grow. The church is not grown because we are preaching the truth. And we will preach the truth. And we will stand on the truth. And the Lord will keep us by his power in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. But when you are there and then there is no, no soundness of the word in you. The, 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 the word has no root. No foundation in you. No shock absorber to help you to hold you. When situation comes and then the Bible says people like that will renounce the Lord. Renounce the Lord. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 verse 8 through to 13. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my sake. For my sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another. 
Many offended and betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall do what? Shall wax cold. Even those that claim to have been standing, those that claim to have been running, the Bible says, he whosoever that thinketh his standard should take it less he fall. The Bible says, the love of many will wax cold. When you see your neighbor, you don't know how they are doing their business and making money. And you become so covetous of their money and you want to go after them, you become cold in your relationship with the Lord. You become cold in your prayer life. You become cold in your commitment and sacrifice unto the Lord. You want to make money like them and you may end up dying like them. Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You will be saved. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8. You will resolve to follow the Lord, to serve the Lord, to live for God. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For verse 38. Everybody? I need you again. For I am persuaded. I am convinced beyond every reasonable doubt. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, not things present, not things to come, not height, not depth, not any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I need an amen. amen. You know, there are some people who claim to be Christian. Somebody offended them. The next thing they do is they, they say, I'm leaving the church. They cannot speak like Paul. That I'm fully persuaded that nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. There are some people that a little correction, a little discipline, they pack their bags and baggages, I'm leaving the church. Have you ever seen any family? We children in the family don't get corrected. That won't be a true family. That won't be a real family. That would be a fake family, maybe a TV family. Make believe family. And then you're in the family, and your father, your mother, maybe your spiritual or biological, they are correct, and you, and, you, and you grew wing, and you grew wing, and you say, you do it your way, you do it your way. Here, Paul is saying that nothing will separate me from the love of God. The Lord will keep you. The Lord will preserve you in Jesus' name. And you know, with all this that we have said, it is your choice whether you will end up regretting or rejoicing. Because everything that has a beginning has an end. Man has a choice whether to rejoice or to regret at the end of his life. Understand anything you are doing now, everything you are doing now leads to a certain end. A certain end. The people of there, they call it destination. Destination. And everyone will depart from this world one day. I will depart one day. You will depart one day. And uh, after our departure from here, we'll end up somewhere. Where will you spend eternity? Eternity, eternity. Where will you spend eternity? This message comes to you and to me. And it doesn't matter whether I'm a preacher or you're a pew member. It doesn't matter. God is no respecter of anybody. No. God is no respecter of anybody. Whether you are a man or you are a woman, whether you are educated or illiterate, the Bible actually refers to people that will miss heaven as unprofitable servants. Unprofitable. That means no matter what you have done, you have been a preacher all your life, but you have lived in secret sin. You have not honored the Lord with your private life. The Bible says unprofitable. Whether you are ministering in any other area of the, ministry, or, or, of the church or ministry, but then your life does not honor the Lord, does not glorify the Lord. The, the word of God says you are unprofitable. Look at it, the book of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 verse 30. 
and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. You will not be rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. With tears. You know, another translation proceeds this way. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. I'm reading from another translation. It says, who for a single meal, a single meal, a single meal, sold his inheritance. Every believer has inheritance. Sold his inheritance right. As the oldest son, afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. You will not regret at the end of your life in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. And if you have time, please go back and read that Matthew chapter 25, read from the very first beginning and then see the parable of the, um, what do they call it now, uh, the ladies that were waiting for the coming, the ten virgins, the ten virgins. Um, then, but let's quickly jump to verse 21. He slept said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That is a moment of rejoicing. No matter the challenge you go through now, if you are faithful, you will rejoice at the end of the day in Jesus' name. Amen. And that is why Paul the Apostle in Acts, the Apostle chapter 20, verse 24, he said, But none of these things move me, neither can't I my life dear unto myself so that I may finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. None of these things move me. Look up here. They will talk about you at your back. None of these things move me. They will criticize your good intention. None of these things move me. They will castigate you as this or as that. They will accuse you of pride, of high-handedness. None of these things move me. They will accuse you of holier-than-thou attitude. None of these things move me. No. No. They will persecute you because of what you stand for. None of these things move me. Paul said, I count my life not there unto myself. For as long as I'm standing in the right, for as long as I'm preaching the true gospel of Christ, for as long as I'm living my life for the glory of God, for as long as I am not living a double life, two-faced man, two-faced woman, they are wanting to hear you another thing over there. None of these things move me. None of these things move me. Even though you see people that, uh, that because of their own inability to stand for the truth and righteousness, because they want to dress like Jezebel, and then they accuse you, they attack you, and now you see, none of these things move me. The Lord will keep you in Jesus' name. You will not be moved. I say you will not be moved. And then, finally, finally, you have the choice of deciding for either retribution or reward. When I use the word retribution, I'm talking about vengeance, the vengeance of God. You have to decide whether to be prepared for the vengeance of the Lord or for the reward from the Lord. You have to prepare for the day of reckoning, the day of reckoning, 
the day of reckoning. Judgment day is coming. And understand, even before you die, during this lifetime of hours on earth, we must make a choice whether we want to experience God's cause or the blessing of the Lord. Because here on earth, causes are there, blessings are there. It's your choice to decide which particular one that you want between them. If we obey God and walk according to his commandments, we will experience his blessing on earth. But if we disobey, then his cause abides with us. Revelation chapter 22 verse 12. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give to every man according to his work shall be. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. He's telling us something that we all need to pay close attention to because this is not talking about the end of the world, the end of age, and the things that shall be at the latter end, so that you will not labor in vain. I will not labor, labor in vain. None of us will labor in vain in Jesus' name. Matthew 25, verse 31. It says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels will him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divided the sheep from the goat, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goat on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, you will inherit heaven. In the name of Jesus. Daniel chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. And at that time shall Michael stand up and great prince, that, the, great, the great prince, we stand up for the children of the people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since the world, uh, since, since there was a nation even to the same time, at the time of thy people shall be delivered. Now, the Lord is saying that time of trouble is coming. Time of problem is coming. Time of anguish is coming. Time of persecution is coming. But as many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life and some to everlasting content. Which one will be your portion? I pray you will awake to everlasting life in Jesus' name. Amen. But then he said in verse 3, he said, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for how long? Forever. Forever and ever. That will be your portion in Jesus' name. So then, Moses has a message for you. He has a message for me. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 29. He said, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they will, that they will consider their latter end. And I pray you'll be wise today and make the right decision in Jesus' name. If you go to heaven or go to hell, it will be your choice, it will be your decision. And I pray that your decision will be the right one for God's glory in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 16. Uh, you can do the reading on your own. The case of the rich man and Lazarus that I spoke to us about. Uh, the rich man end up in hellfire. Lazarus end up in paradise. You will end up in paradise in Jesus' name. If you want to make heaven, make up your mind. You want to make hell, make up your mind. But let, before I wrap it up, let me quickly tell you, hell is a place of sorrow. It's a place of anguish. It's a place of fire. It's a place that is hid from man. It's a place of power. It's a place of consciousness. If anybody goes to hell fire, you'll be conscious you are there in hell fire. It's a soul for the soul and the spirit, and no human body, physical body, cannot be there. It's a place where there will be knowledge and memory that will be existing. It's a place that people will pray. 
you heard the members of the choir, they told us earlier on about the people in hell, but prayers is a place where prayers are not answered. That's unfortunate. It's a place where people will pray. God, forgive me. God, have mercy. God, deliver me. God, help me. But it's a place where no prayer ever gets answered. It's a place of regret. It's a place of sorrow. It's a place of tears. And I pray that the Lord will help you that you don't get to hell in Jesus' name. Heaven will be your goal. Because that is the home of the saints. The saints of the Lord. It's a place prepared by God himself. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. For in my father's house there are many mansions there. If it were not so, I would have told you. He said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, there will, you will be also. I pray that to be your portion in Jesus' name. Heaven is a place where there will be no light. No moon, no sun, no star. You know why? Because God himself will be the light of the place. The place, all day, all night, the place will be full of brightness and brightness and brightness. And the Lord will take you there in Jesus' name. I have the good news for you. Heaven is a place where the tabernacle of God will be. Heaven is a place where all tears will be wiped away. Heaven is a place where there will be no more sorrow, no more anguish in any way or form. There will be no more crying. There will be no more death. There will, no, there, there will be nothing evil befalling anybody. Heaven is a place of reward. It's a place of reward. All that you have done on earth, you'll be rewarded when you get to heaven. In the name of Jesus, heaven is a place of worship. Where we'll be singing hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah. To just praising the Lord. Every heaven is a place where nothing defiling shall ever enter into. How many of you want to make it to heaven? We rise upon your feet and let's go before the Lord right now. Rise upon your feet. The Bible says some highway shall be there and a way. And highway shall be there and a way. It's not for the sinners. The way is for the way fearing men. No unclean thing shall ever stray into it. No unclean thing. No unclean thing will ever stray into it. But then whether you make heaven or not, it's your choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. If you are going on the narrow way or the broad way, it's your choice. God wants you on the narrow way that leads to heaven. The broad way leads to eternal perdition. Understand, sinners will go to eternity. Saints will go to eternity. But which of the two eternities will you want to end up? Forget about position. Forget about title. Forget about title. I tell myself every, every day, every time, Whatever I'm doing right now is a privilege, it's an opportunity. It's not a qualification for me to get to heaven. Let nothing get to your head. Let nothing, let no pride take you over. Because I'm this, because I'm that. And you are even nothing, and yet you can live for God. You are nothing, and you can do the will of God. You can serve the purpose of the master. Where will you spend eternity? Those that have gone. Without salvation, they are regretting all through eternity. All through eternity. All through eternity. Don't you understand? Even if at the end of the day we are wrong, even though we know we are not wrong because the scripture is not wrong, that holiness is not required, but you are holy, you see me careful. But supposing we are right, that holiness is actually required and you go to heaven without holiness. And then you miss heaven all through eternity. Without any opportunity of making right your way, call upon the Lord right now. Seek him, seek him, seek him. The name of the church is not enough to deliver you. 
The activities you do in the church is not enough to deliver you. The position or the title that we hold is not enough to deliver us. Where will you spend eternity? Where will I spend eternity? The fear of man will not save us on the day of judgment. The praise of man will not be able to stand on the day of judgment when God will judge with vengeance. It's your choice. You said, I'm young. I'm still a student. I'm still a youth. When I grow old, I will know the Lord. Who told you you will grow old? Don't you know youths are dying? Children are dying? Where will you spend eternity? Give up the world. The world of sin. The world of transgression. The word of anger and bitterness. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. You've been coming to church. Does the word of God have root in you? A persecution comes. Opposition comes. Problem comes. Discipline comes. Will you still stand? Will you still stand? Will you still stand or you fall away like a dry leaf? Or you fall away like a dry branch in the tree? Heaven is a holy place. Students, youth, heaven is a holy place. Daddy, mommy, heaven is a holy place. Married, single, heaven is a holy place. Strive to make heaven. Strive to make heaven. Give up sin. Give up, transgre give up transgression. Give up iniquity. Give up secret sin. Give it up. Give it up. In Jesus' name we pray. Gracious, most high God, we have heard your word this very morning. You have spoken to our ears, our hearts. Can we stand this word? Lord, shall this word stand against us on the last day? We surrender our hearts, Lord. We bow low before you. We pray, Lord, of our own we have no strength. We depend upon you, Lord. I believe somebody has taken a decision. A decision to walk with the Lord. A decision to knock out, reject, refuse. To bow, uh, to bow and to follow the way of the flesh. I believe, Lord, that somebody has said, I surrender. I yield. I repent of my sins. I go back no more to the world. Father, Lord, I pray, multiply your grace this morning. Increase yourself in us, Lord. We are living in the world, but Lord, you have made us to understand that we are not of the world. And that is to say we have a home, a place, heaven. And none can get there with unrighteousness. Sin will never enter in. Lord, 
that it will not be too late just to be turned back at the gate. It will not be too late, Lord, that we will not wait until that time. One will not wait until death. We will not wait until Christ comes and meet us on our way. Lord, we pray this morning, let the hardened heart, the stony heart be broken. Amen. Lord, let our fallow grounds be torn. Amen. Father, Lord, we pray, let, let the undecided, O oh God, make the decision today. Amen. Let, O oh God, the one that was adamant, say, Lord, I bow. I am asking, Lord, multiply your grace to as many as had, have decided while on this earth. Lord, as many that have decided, we are not yet there. Lord, we are still striving. We are still on this side of the world. Oh God, we pray when temptation comes, when the devil wants to st stay at us and challenge our faith and decisions, multiply your grace, Lord. Amen. We have no strength of our own. We depend upon you, Lord. In every situation in life, the decisions that have affected us will not be the reason for whatever that will become of us on the last day. Christ, Lord, we will meet with you on that last day. We will see you face to face. Help is not our portion. Heaven is our goal. You take us there in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for hearing our prayers. For we pray in Jesus' name.